It's time for ROTD Weekend. The world is divided over many things these days, and you know I don't take that lightly, but the division at the moment seems to be whether you are a Valentine's Day person or a Super Bowl person, at least in terms of my social media feed. When I'm looking at different food things going by, I am either seeing like sweet chocolate Valentine's Day stuff or I am seeing wonderful Super Bowl foods. You know which side of this I am on. I don't really have a sweet tooth, the odd thing, but it's just not, not really me. And so I am all about Super Bowl foods. I love that big spread of dips and cheeses and crackers and nachos and wings and all of those wonderful savory snacks foods. And I have to say that I, for one, am delighted that Taylor Swift has become a Super Bowl sensation and that she's going to be at the game and that people are talking about it. And the reason is not so much that I am a Swifty. I am not, but I'm not not a Swifty. I'm just not really a fangirl kind of person. I haven't been like all about a famous person since I, well, the Bare Naked Ladies, the band. I loved them when I was a teenager. I saw them perform like 30 times. But since then, then I haven't really had that kind of fan-like mentality for myself, but I know that a lot of other people do. And I will say, even though I am not a Swifty, I am excited that she's going to be at the game because it's one more thing for me to be excited about during the Super Bowl. There is the food, of course. There are the commercials. There's the halftime show. And now there's also Taylor Swift sightings to look forward to. And I do think it's going to mean more people watching the game. And I really miss that, like, monoculture, we're all doing the same thing kind of thing, right? So that is super fun. And it means more people will be at my Super Bowl party eating my food with me, watching the commercials and the halftime show, looking for those Taylor sightings and chatting with me in the kitchen while the actual game is going on. So I am excited about the Taylor Swift Super Bowl thing. And I am looking forward to seeing what she's wearing and what color lipstick she'll have on and if she's going to be dressed up for the team or wearing something awesome. All of that is actually very exciting to me. And I may be a little bit surprised myself. So this year, for sure, I land more on the Super Bowl side than the Valentine's Day side when it comes to what food things I'm thinking about and sharing on social media and cooking up right now. But not everybody is like me, and today's guest is most definitely not like me in this way. I am talking with Jenny Field from PastryChefOnline.com. If you have never encountered Jenny before, you are in for a treat. She's a treat, and she makes delicious treats, too. She has brought a surprise recipe of the day for me, and it is just the thing for Valentine's Day, whether you have a sweet tooth or not. I cannot wait for you to get to know Jenny. Let's listen. Hi, Jenny. Welcome back. Thank you so much for having me back on. I feel so validated. Oh, well, you should feel amazing because you have... So many wonderful recipes and such a great following. I love, I love you on Facebook. Anybody listening, if you don't follow Jenny Field Pastry Chef online, did I say that all right? Yeah. On Facebook, you need to. It's all, it's such a warm, beautiful, accepting group of people who are just nerding out over the delicious things you make. It's, it's such a treat. It's a real treat to see you in my feed all the time. So I'm excited to have you on. Well, I'm always excited to talk to you, but I'm super excited because Valentine's Day is a few days away and you are the perfect person to talk about sweet things and loving them and and that sort of stuff. What is on your radar as like exciting sweet treats for this season this year? Well, I have a couple of ideas for people who want to go um, in an easier route. Panna cotta is always lovely Mm. because it's just like this wonderful gelatin set pudding that is just like rich and smooth and creamy and delightful. I have some very decided opinions on how one should make panna cotta. So if you come to my site, you'll see there's like a couple of extra steps in there to make sure that it's creamy because if it sets 
before your cream is creamy and like thick, then it's going to be like jello, like slick. And I don't want slick. That's gross. So I've got a couple of steps in my recipes for panna cotta that ensures that it's a creamy set and not like a slick set. Okay, I'm fascinated. First, I, I know that you have brought a surprise recipe for me. I want to make sure is it, it's not the panna cotta, right? It's no. not. Okay, good. So I have questions about panna cotta. So okay. because I've had panna cotta before and I don't love it. And I think it, to me, it tastes like milk jello or something. So because people are not making it right. They're not taking the time. I get so annoyed. We went to a restaurant one time in Asheville, North Carolina. This is years ago. And they had a panna cotta that had pink peppercorn and blah, blah, blah. I was like, oh, that sounds fancy and delightful. So I ordered it and it came and they had molded them in little, those little like two ounce, four ounce, whatever, solo jobbies and then unmolded them. So it said solo on the top of it. I'm like, y'all oh. really? And then all of the particulate matter, like all the vanilla beans and the little pieces of pink peppercorn were not suspended throughout. They were like, they sank to the bottom. Oh. So when you turn it out, they're like all speckled on the top. And I'm like, oh, I was very disappointed. So what you have to do to fight against that is you have to let the mixture start to gel while mm -hmm. you're whisking it. And also, I always hold out a portion of the heavy cream, whip that until it's thick, but not like making peaks or anything. Mm -hmm. Fold that together with the cooling gelatin mixture. And that way it's thick enough when you pour it into your molds that vanilla beans or whatever you have in there are suspended oh. and the whole texture is creamy instead of milk jello, which is no fun at all. Well, I, every single, I'm going to be very honest with you, Jenny, every single time that I hear somebody rave about panna cotta, I'm like, oh, wow, great. And part of my brain is like, I don't like that at all. But no, I now I know why, that. and I'm going to head over to your website. I will link to this for other people as well. You said you had another idea. So the panna cotta was the easy idea? Because it doesn't take super long to make. There's mm -hmm. maybe five or six ingredients in it. It's it's pretty straightforward process. Like I said, I've, I've got a couple of extra steps in there to make sure it's creamy, but it's not hard. And then my other fun thing I like to do is I like to make sweet rolls, but instead of rolling them up from one end, I roll them up from both ends like a scroll and cut them across. And then when you put them in a round pan with the, the snaily parts to the outside mm -hmm. and that center pointing in when they bake, look like hearts. Oh my God. Is that on your website too? Yes. Okay. I, I need to see it. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm writing it down on my to-do list actually that I'm going to go look. I love so that idea. I think I call them chocolate Sweet heart honey bun. I don't know. I don't remember what they're called, but they're adorable. I love that. Oh, and I love, you know what, the the inventiveness of that and what you had to say about panna cotta. I feel like on some level, you and I are like kindred spirits on a different parts of our tongue. Like you're like figuring out like the best way to do things with sweet. And I'm like over here nerding out about like brining chicken breasts. But we're like both trying to figure out like, how do you do this? I think also like in the best way that isn't insane. Right. Yeah. I don't want to like get so like perseverating on something that I turn into Rain Man necessarily, yeah. you know, yeah. but I do test things multiple times with slight variations to make sure that whatever I'm presenting to my people is the best I can possibly make it be. Yeah, no, I love it. I really, really love that. Now you have a surprise recipe for me today. I do. And let me tell you why. Shall I tell you why I have chosen it? Yes, I would love that. Okay. So right now, Pastry Chef Online, in my little Facebook group, which is called Fearless Kitchen Friends, we are having a bake along. Oh. And I had people choose which recipe they wanted to do. They could have a brown butter cookie dough that they could add whatever mix-ins they wanted to, um, a basic buttermilk muffin that they could add whatever they wanted to, and then a sweet dough that they could fill however they wanted. And the voting came in and the sweet dough won. Oh. And so this is, it's actually, it's the sweet dough that I use to make the honey buns. Mm. And I use it for several things on the site too, because it's just a really beautiful dough. So like the main URL for it 
on my site is homemade cinnamon rolls, but I use this dough for all sorts of things. It works for sticky buns. It works for the honey buns, the little sweetheart guys I was telling you about. I've made variations where I've used coffee in the dough instead of the standard Mm -hmm. buttermilk. And that was like a peanut butter coffee sweet roll thing. So it's really versatile. It's a beautiful dough to work with. You get 12 really beautiful cinnamon rolls and there's no waste, which is nice. Um, It does not stick to the counter. So there's no flouring the counter and then getting your dough too tough because there's flour all over it. It's just, it's beautiful to work with. So we're right in the middle of the bake bake long right now. And several people have already baked and I've baked two different things with it. And everybody who has baked has said, oh my God, this dough is magical. One of my people just posted this morning saying, I had always used the KitchenAid sweet dough recipe in their cinnamon rolls. And this is going to be my new go-to because it's just so easy to work with. That's beautiful. Wow. I love that. Okay. I have questions though. So I'm not really um, pastry knowledgeable. So the the dough that I have used for cinnamon buns in the past has been almost like a bread dough, like bready, yeasty kind of thing. Is that what you're talking about? Or sort of more of those flaky crescent roll kind of things? No, this is definitely like a a sweet, bready, yeasty thing. Mm, I love it. Okay, good. I like those. I don't like the other ones quite as much, but that sounds great. They're not as good. (laughs) It's so true. It's so true. Okay, so this is a sweet yeast dough that's wonderful to work with and that you can use for a whole bunch of different things, including heart-shaped Valentine's Day treats. Love that. You bread with it. You could like take little bits of it, like stuff something inside it Mm. and then and then squeeze them together in little balls and then stick them in a pan and pour some goo over it. I mean, there's really lots of different things you could make with it. And the dough itself is already sweet too. Like if I put something like, if I stuffed it with like cream cheese, it would already have that sweetness to it it wouldn't turn it's not savory super sweet mm-hmm. no i don't think i would use it for savory necessarily there's two ounces of sugar in it so it's not a ton mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. it's, it's like one sixth of an ounce of sugar per roll basically so it's not super sweet but it is enriched with um there's a little bit of the tang from buttermilk and it's got a whole egg and four yolks. So there's a lot of emulsifiers in it. And it's this beautiful sort of pale yellow color because of all of those yolks. It's it's just, it's a sexy dough. It really is so pretty. I love that. Okay. So where do you start? Where do you start when making this? Well, I start with making sure everything is at room temperature because it has some melted butter in it. And I don't want to pour hot butter in into cold buttermilk and then have little pebbles. So everything is at room temperature. You can even warm stuff up a tiny bit if you want to. And it's it's a straight dough, which means everything can go into the pool at the same time. I usually add all the liquid stuff first, so like the egg and the yolks. I put the salt in there as well. What else? The sugar, the buttermilk, and then the melted butter. And mix that a little bit. And then in goes all-purpose flour. I use King Arthur because you want a little bit higher protein all-purpose flour, but you don't need to use bread flour. Mm -hmm. And then the yeast. I use instant yeast. Toss it in with everything else and then mix it until it gets... You were going to say something. I see your Uh, finger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Jenny and I are on video, even though you can't see our video, but that means that when my face gets puzzled and my finger goes up, she knows I have a question. (laughs) I have a few, but so King Arthur all-purpose flour is different from my grocery store's no-name store brand flour? Yes. King Arthur generally tends to have a bit higher protein. So a lot of like, say you go to the regular grocery store and maybe gold metal flour, which is a a good nationally known brand, all purpose flour, but is really a little bit better for cakes than it is for bread because it's just got kind of a lower protein content. So things aren't going to rise quite as high. Since you're making sweet rolls, they're not rising up. They're rising out and into each other. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to use bread flour to get like a huge loaf, right? You just want it to have kind of a softness, but at the same time, a bit of chew. And King Arthur All Purpose, I find, is the best flour for that. For that. And you would use a different flour for a cake or for actual bread. 
Well, I usually use King Arthur's bread flour for mm. bread. Sometimes mm. I use half and half. It just kind of depends. Mm. You know, like the higher the protein, generally the chewier the bread is going to be. And so I just think, okay, what do I want this bread to do? Do I want it to be like a soft sandwich bread? I might use more all-purpose flour. If I wanted like a really chewy artisan kind of bread, I would use more bread flour. So mm. just kind of depends. Okay. Then my other question was about the butter pellets that you would get if everything wasn't at room temperature. I'm pretty sure that I know why, but I just, I'm going to ask anyways. So if it's, if everything's at the right temperature, then the butter is going to be like smoothly mixed in. But if you have those little pellets, it's, it, you're going to have like, like pockets of that richness somehow or something like that. Is that? Well, I mean, I think honestly with the long mixing time that it takes, probably it would even itself out. But why make the mixer work harder than it has to? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like when you make a cake and you cream the butter and the sugar together and it's light and fluffy and beautiful. And then you start throwing cold eggs in there. The butter seizes up and then your batter looks all curdled and you're all sad and puzzled. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, you know, you work so hard to get this creamy, pliable butter action happening. Mm -hmm. Why would you kill that by putting 40 degree eggs on top of that. You, you know, Jenny, so. you know, I don't, I don't bake a lot. And you're like, reminding me of why <laughs> I don't like the I don't like all these rules and I break them all the time. Room temperature eggs, mine are cold. Oh, well. <laughs> and I like, I know, I know I could put them in like a cup of hot water, warm water for a little while or something, but I don't. <laughs> and then the result is oh. never as good as it could be. Right. You know, I am not a planner and baking often requires some planning and getting things out early. And sometimes I forget to, I'm like, well, poop, now what do I do? So yeah, I have done the bowl of hot water and warm the eggs up real fast and put an egg in my pocket before. <laughs> I mean, like different ways to get it to warm up faster. And is your cake going to be successful even if you don't? It's going to be fine. It probably isn't going to rise quite as much. It's probably mm -hmm. not be quite as emulsified. But is it still going to be delicious? Probably. So these are just like little tips to keep in mind if you're looking for the best version of something. If you just want to get something in your face, you're going to be fine. <laughs> but, you know, a little bit of planning will will yield like the best results. I love that. I love it so much. And yes, I, I, can, I, can, I can try sometimes. I, I, I'm really intrigued by this dough because I... I don't have a huge sweet tooth and it sounds like I could make this dough and do something that's moderately sweet and doesn't have to be like cloying, you know? So I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you here and I will make sure that my ingredients are at room temperature if you tell me that. <laughs> so yeah, I, I love like the cinnamon roll, like the initial recipe for this sweet dough. There's, um, cause I was doing the math in my head trying to figure out how sweet really are these things, you know, when you eat one, because it's not like it's a low calorie snack or anything. But again, you've got a sixth of an ounce of sugar per roll in the dough. There's roughly eight ounces of brown sugar in the filling. So that's less than one ounce per roll. What is it like two thirds of an ounce per roll? How much sugar? I don't, I also don't weigh anything when I'm. Cup, like super packed brown sugar, about a cup. Is how many ounces? Eight-ish for Eight. brown oh, sugar. so it's the same as um, weight there then. Okay. For the, mostly, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, just about. Okay, got it. So they're not like overly sweet. You still taste that yeasty, bready goodness. And I also make sure that in my filling, there's enough salt to temper the sweetness. I don't like a one note sweet. Mm -hmm. And the best way to bring dimension to a sweet baked good is to add salt to it. Mm -hmm. I get so disappointed if I order something out or I have something somewhere. <laughs> it just tastes flat. Yeah. It's very disappointing to me. So use some salt. Put salt in yeah. everything you make. I have a, I just came up with a caramel coffee syrup and you better believe there's a little bit of salt in that syrup. I'm with you on that too. Even like fruitier things, you would think maybe like, oh, don't put salt in that strawberry filling, but like everything. Yeah. Yeah. Literally everything I make, there's at least a little bit of salt in it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm with you on that. Absolutely. Okay, so you're putting everything, all the ingredients are in the bowl. It, it's your buttermilk, eggs, butter, flour. I can give you the actual ingredients and the amounts if you want. Um, Sure, I, I'll link to this for people as well, but I just want to make sure I have yeah. the full list in my head. Yeah, yolks, 
egg, salt, sugar, melted butter, buttermilk. So six ingredients in the bowl, mix that up. So like the eggs break up a little bit Mm -hmm. and then dump in the flour and the yeast. So it's eight ingredients all together. I mix, I start with the dough hook. I don't understand why you would start with the paddle attachment and then switch out. Start with a dough hook. It'll do its job. Mm -hmm. It'll be fine. Mm -hmm. So you mix it for like a minute or so until most of the flour is absorbed. And this is the thing that is so cool about this dough and that people who have been making it during the bake along are finding because I I tell them, listen, gluten formation is a product of time as well as kneading, right? So don't start adding flour. It's going to be sticking in the bottom and on the sides. You're going to be super sad, but just let it go. Mm -hmm. You know, just Mm -hmm. let the bread knead. And as that gluten develops, it starts to pull itself off of the sides Mm -hmm. because it becomes stretchy and it gathers itself into a ball. So by the time you're finished kneading, which is 10 to 12 minutes, Mm -hmm. um, it's a pretty good long knead. And sometimes you need to give your mixer a little bit of a rest, but that's fine. You know, if it starts getting hot, turn it off, cover the bowl, walk away for 15 minutes, come back and finish because that 15 minute rest is also going to help because the liquid is working on the flour to tenderize it. And so all kinds of magical little sciencey things are happening while Mm -hmm. it rests too. So Mm -hmm. it's not a big deal to stop your need in the middle if you need to. So I'm embarrassed to admit this. I no longer have a stand mixer. Mine stopped working about a year ago and I've been like, I don't need it anymore. This can be done by hand, I assume. Yeah, yeah. You could make it, start it in a bowl and then knead it on the counter. It will take probably a fair bit of kneading. I think if you're going to make it by hand, I might consider letting everything rest on the counter after you mix the dough, let it rest for an hour or so covered Mm. and then start kneading it to kind of give the liquid time to work on those proteins kind of give you a little bit of a head start because it'll take a fair bit of kneading. So then when you're, if you're kneading it by hand, same advice, try not to add flour unless absolutely necessary. Do not add, do not add flour. Do not. Add do flour. not. What I would do is because it will be a little sloppy to begin with. I would pan spray my counter and oil up my hands and that way it won't stick to you. Mm-hmm. So you won't be tempted to add flour because if you add flour, you're just going to end up sad, you know, because they'll be too tough. Okay, got it. So no flour, no matter what, do not add flour and knead the heck out of it. Yes, got it. This is one of those things where you just have to trust the process. Okay, got it. And we're kneading for a good long time, whether with the mixer or with our hands. Okay, great. Got it. What do you do next? Well, yeast is one of those things that works on your schedule. You don't have to feel like you have to work on yeast schedule. You're smarter than a one cell organism. You can make it work for you. So you can gather it into a ball, spray it and put it in the refrigerator, let it hang out overnight or whatever. Like if you run out of time Mm -hmm. or you can go ahead and roll it immediately, roll it out into a huge rectangle, like 22 inches wide by maybe 16 inches and then spread whatever filling, roll it up and then cut them into your rolls. And then you can let them rise in the pan. You can let the dough rise for a couple of hours before you roll it out. I mean, there's there's not just one way to do it. Sometimes I make the rolls at night, roll them out, roll them up, put them in a pan and throw them in the refrigerator. Other times if I'm making them and end up making it earlier in the day, I can just let them rise after I make them. I make a cozy place in the microwave and let them rise there. Mm-hmm. So just make it work for your schedule. And then you bake them and they're done in like 25 or 30 minutes and then everybody's happy. So this doesn't require first rise, punch down, second rise. It can just be shape and rise one time, or you, you can, can do that, first or rise, or you can punch do down. two. Yes, you're going to end up with probably a more like ethereal kind of texture if you let them rise twice. Mm-hmm. And normally, that's what I would do. I would make the dough, let it rise for a couple of hours, and then roll it out, fill it. And then let it hang out in the refrigerator overnight or just keep going and let them do the second rise. You can make them all in one day or you could even stretch it over three days, depending on how busy you were or whatever is going on in your life. 
So you put the filling and then you put them in the fridge overnight. I guess in my head somewhere, I have some memory of doing things along those lines and everything getting kind of sloppy. Like somehow the bread and the filling have merged into one in a way that I don't think was supposed to happen. Am I? Well, I am a proponent of rolling the dough out as large as possible and as thinly as you can. So you get... Like if you don't roll it out big enough, you're still dealing with X amount of filling, right? And if you're spreading X amount of filling on a small thing, mm. it's going to be super thick. But if you spread that same X amount of filling over a huge surface, it's going to be much thinner. And also, not only will the filling be thinner, so it's not going to goop out as much, um, you have more coils. So it's prettier to look at too. You know, like you see some people's cinnamon rolls and they sort of maybe have kind of one or two half-hearted swirls in them. Yeah. But these, like if you if you take the time to roll it super big, you'll have like beautiful swirls. Mm. And after they sit overnight or even sitting in the refri- in the cozy place in the microwave to rise the second time, yeah, some of that butter and the the goo is gonna leak out a little bit and you're gonna end up with like a syrup on the bottom Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of your pan, but that's okay because it gets reabsorbed as it bakes. And then you end up with this kind of wonderful butterscotchy, chewy yumminess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's another, it's another reason. Have you seen those TikTok cinnamon rolls where they're like, pour a pint of cream over your rolls before you bake them? Well, first of all, that does nothing but add a ton of liquid and a ton of fat Mm -hmm. with no real extra flavor. You've already got the syrup in the bottom of your pan. Just use that. There'll be plenty gooey enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to spend $4 on a pint of cream to pour over the top of your cinnamon rolls. You're just going to glaze anyway. Sometimes there's, you know, too much is too much. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, again, as somebody who doesn't have a huge sweet tooth, I do see those videos and I'm right away like, oh no, no, please stop. Stop. That's too much. <laughs> too much. Right. So I want to know, I think, I think I need two more things answered. So, so they're rising in the pan that you're going to bake them in, right? You're not going to try and transfer them. Does it matter what that is? And should it be lined with parchment or something because you have that crispy syrup stuff going on? If you have a nonstick pan, you shouldn't have to line it. Okay. I often will line a pan just for extra insurance, but I don't with these cinnamon rolls as long as I'm baking in a nonstick pan. If I am baking in a regular, like a round cake pan, then I will pan spray really well, but I don't use parchment. Mm-hmm. But so to answer your question, yes, you can bake them in whatever you want. You can put one in a mug if you you can bake them in little coffee cups if you want to you Mm -hmm. know like Mm -hmm. individuals you can spread them out farther on a half sheet tray so the sides don't touch if you're one of those people who likes the crunchy on the outside you know I am a soft and gooey person Mm -hmm. so I like them closer together so they bake together so all the sides are soft Mm -hmm. But some people like them so they have like the super round shape instead of looking all square because they've smushed up against each other. I don't care. Anyway. Yeah, no, 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 no. I like, I like my mom used to make them. They're all squished together in a pan. So, and, and so it's a non, non-stick pan, like nine by 13, eight by eight. Nine by 13 to make 12 of them. Mm-hmm. Or you could do, like, if you wanted to do the heart shaped ones, mm. that'll do six in like an eight or nine inch round pan with the little snaily parts out and the points all shoving into the middle. I love that. And then you can use the other half of the dough to make them however you want. You can do them in an eight by eight pan or whatever. And then they come out of the oven. And I immediately glaze them. I make a super thick glaze that has, um, it starts with melted butter and melted um, cream cheese. And I used to make them without the butter, without the cream cheese. But there's, if you've ever had just like a powdered sugar glaze, it's exceedingly sweet for one thing. And it also has this kind of weird raw kind of flavor Mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. It's, and I think it's from the cornstarch that is kind of mixed in with the powdered sugar to keep it from clumping up together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so using, if you don't like cream cheese, that's fine. Just use butter. It makes it read more like an American buttercream frosting than a super sweet glaze. And Mm -hmm. then obviously you want to add 
some salt to that as well, a little vanilla, and then thin it out if you need to with a little cream or milk or half and half or whatever you have lying around. I made them with orange juice the other day. I made, I put orange zest in the dough and I made a cinnamon and orange zest filling and then iced them with orange glaze. And it was just super good. They were, they were really, really I, good. I want that right now. Okay, wait, one one more question and then I will stop. I, <laughs> I, I feel like I need like questions. baking 101 with Jenny. You're like advanced. We're doing these buns. And I'm like, I just want to know. So you take them out of the oven and you're going to mm-hmm. put the glaze on them right away. And then do they yes. stay in the pan until they're cool um, enough to take out? Like, are they going to fall apart if I try to eat them right away? What's going to happen? Well, you know, like, okay, you know, cinnamon bread. So that has like the little swirlies in it. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't fall apart when you slice it. But with a cinnamon roll with all that butter, the whole point of a cinnamon roll is to unroll it and eat it one little gooey bite at a time. That's how I like to eat them anyway. So, um, so it's not really going to fall apart. Part, I would let them cool to warm. I always take temperatures of everything oh. and I leave bread stuff alone until it gets under 140 degrees Fahrenheit because all of the starches and the flour need to set back up. Otherwise, when you cut into something that's super hot, that is flour and yeast based, you just get kind of a gummy mess because mm-hmm. those flowers haven't set back again. So I, yeah, I would usually wait maybe an hour or so, but definitely eat them warm. I've never heard about the 140 degrees before. I, I love that. I know like when you're roasting meat, you want to make sure that the temperature has come down, you let it rest and then the juices don't go pouring out when you cut into it. This seems to be for a different reason, but also science. Yes. But yes, definitely it's a sciencey reason because not only is gluten happening in your bread dough, but so is like the starches are gelatinizing as they heat in the oven mm-hmm. and you need them to set up firmly again before you slice your bread to keep that from because otherwise you just like smoosh everything together into just like a gummy mess. Well, I think I've learned I knew I was going to learn something. I learned way more than I expected to. And I am definitely going to try this dough because it sounds like it is the perfect thing. Although I, maybe I need to get that stand mixer first, but I'm going <laughs> to try. Uh, thank you so much, Jenny. Yeah, I, I like to do a lot of things by hand, but um, kneading dough is not one of them. I don't mind. I am pretty for, happy to be using my stand mixer. Yeah, I don't mind for five minutes or so, but yeah, the this longer one seems crazier. But that's okay. I, I might try it anyways. I sometimes find that kind of like tactile, just like going and doing something quite meditative. It's just sort of a rep a repetitious thing that mm-hmm. you just do mindlessly while you think about England or whatever. And I feel like it's actually connecting to, I think maybe now as my hands are starting to look older, like I'm looking down at my hands while they do this and I can see the people who have taught me to do these things. Like I'm looking at like down at their hands too. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. There is, there is such a generational connection with food, I think. Absolutely. Well, I am going to link to this recipe in the show notes for everybody. I will also link to your website, pastrychefonline.com. Yes. Yes, that is me. And the your Facebook. I'm going to do your Facebook profile. And also the Facebook group, Fearless Kitchen Friends, so people can go and see what everybody is making with this dough, because I think it is so yes, exciting. because everybody is super excited. Somebody filled theirs with apricot jam. Somebody's going to do strawberry rhubarb. Somebody's doing caramel. So everybody is – and everybody was really afraid to, to start, but now that they're doing it, they're all excited. So it's cool. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you, Christine. I really appreciate your time. I had such a good time talking to you. Thank you. I had fun too. I told you Jenny was great. And let me say, after she and I finished talking, she sent me a picture of those sweetheart honey buns. And I will definitely put the link to that recipe in the show notes for you as well, because you've got to see these. They are just so pretty and adorable and perfect for Valentine's Day. And I will link to Jenny's group where they are trying out this recipe so you can see what they're doing with that as well. 
As to what is going on in my kitchen this week, Jennifer is joining me again, and we have a few plans not fully formed. I will tell you, though, that just before recording this, I finally went and tried making the bacon hollandaise. So this is basically using my usual blender hollandaise recipe where you put egg yolks in the blender with some salt, lemon juice, a little bit of cayenne. And then while the blender is running, you slowly drizzle in hot melted butter and the blender going full speed and the hot butter going in cooks the eggs like they do when you whisk them making hollandaise and makes this beautiful hollandaise sauce with zero effort. It's amazing. So I just tried that using a full cup of bacon fat instead of the full cup of butter. And it needed a little tweaking, but it totally worked. It's set up into a beautiful sauce with a really nice pale yellow color. Instead of the lemon juice, I'd put a little bit of tomato juice in there. Well, actually, it's spicy V8 that is in my fridge from when my parents were here yet, but that's what I had. But I put a little bit of that in there. I just thought the tomato flavor would add, like the acidity, the lemon in hollandaise, but not quite as much of it. And also tomatoes and bacon go together so well. So that's what I was trying there. And yeah, it set up beautifully. Nice color, nice texture, just not quite right on the flavor. I ended up having to add quite a bit of salt and I stirred in more of of that V8. And of course, I'm not going to make the final recipe call for something that people are unlikely to have, like spicy V8. So I'll, I'll use like normal tomato juice and, and use some spices, hot sauce or something like that to approximate that flavor. But I am very excited that that worked. I've been thinking about it ever since my conversation with Luke Colpin on this show that went live last week. And so I'm really happy that I tried that and we will be perfecting it and filming it and taking pictures of it when Jen is here this week. I'm also still planning to do that cream of shrimp soup. I know it sounds so weird, but I spotted the can of the Campbell's cream of shrimp soup the other day. Well, I guess it's a couple weeks ago now, and I'd never heard of it before, and I was intrigued, and then I bought a can, and I still haven't tasted it. So I need to taste the Campbell's condensed cream of shrimp soup and see what I think, and if I like it, and if I think that I can make something similar, I'm going to give it a try. I still just think it could be a really nice, easy, simple thing to do that is also kind kind of fancy. I don't know why shrimp just read as fancy to me always. So those two things are on the list right now. I'm also thinking about doing a one pound meatloaf recipe. I know I heard from several people when I did the chicken meatloaf recipe recently that they really liked that it was just one pound of ground chicken and that you can make more than one loaf if you want to, but it's just a nice small recipe. And I don't have a one pound ground beef meatloaf recipe on either of the sites. So I think I might do that. I do understand, you know, you buy the meat in like one to one and a quarter pound package and that's how much your family needs. That's how much you want to make, right? And then I think we might do some more videos from older recipes on the site that don't have videos already. I have a whole bunch of those on the list and I haven't decided, but probably the copycat French onion soup dip. So, you know, that dip that's like sour cream in a packet of Lipton onion soup. I have a homemade version of that. I think that would be a wonderful thing to make a video of. It won't be in time for Super Bowl, but I am telling you about it in time for Super Bowl. So if you need an extra little thing to make tomorrow, that would be a great one. And then maybe also a video for, well, it's not really a recipe. I have a post on the cookful for how to pre-cook whole bell peppers so that they cook more quickly when you do stuffed peppers. So for instance, if you already have a fully cooked filling and you've got rice and ground beef or you have leftovers, spaghetti of some kind that you want to put into a pepper, but everything is cooked and warm already, then you don't want to have to put that into the pepper and then into the oven for like an hour because that's how long it takes. Instead, you can simmer the peppers for a very short time and then fill them, top them with cheese, put them in the oven for a very short time and they're done. So I might do a video for that as well. As to what is going live on the site, I have two recipes going up this week. The first is for easy, creamy salmon pasta. This is so good. My daughter had it for dinner two days in a row by choice and then wanted it again on the third day. It is that good. And I love this recipe because you can make it using either fresh salmon, like uncooked raw fresh salmon or canned salmon. And it's actually really good both ways. So it's just a wonderful recipe to have in your back pocket. And you can use either for like a fancy salmon pasta dinner or just a, oh no, what am I making tonight? We have canned salmon. Let's go. You know, the other recipe going live is 
is on the cookful and it is for pizza seasoning. So this just tastes like you're in a pizzeria. I don't know how else to describe it. It just has all the smells and flavors of like a great pizza restaurant. And I just want to put it on everything. But you definitely can sprinkle it on pizza. You can put it in like just a cheese quesadilla with a slice of tomato and then a little bit of this and it just tastes like you're having pizza. And it's because it has like the Italian seasonings that are in the sauce quite often, the oregano, the basil, but it also has some of the seasonings that are in pepperoni, even like hot mustard and red pepper flakes. And there's some smoked paprika in there to give that like smoky flavor. It is just so good. I cannot wait for you to try that one as well. And then, of course, I am coming to you this week every day with more delicious recipes. I've got something special for you for tomorrow for Super Bowl. I have a really light and beautiful classic on Monday. You're going to love it. Something a little fancy on Tuesday leading up to Valentine's Day. And I'm telling you about something creamy and delicious on Valentine's Day. And that pizza seasoning is coming on Friday. So there is so much to look forward to. Stay tuned every morning. Make sure you are subscribed to this show. Search for Recipe of the Day wherever you listen to podcasts and click follow or subscribe there. You can also just go to cookthestory.com slash ROTD. And then you can click on any of the podcast player buttons there to subscribe. You can actually listen to the show right there as well. And that is the place where you can find the links to all the recipes that I talk about. So if you hear me talking about something, you're like, no, 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 I need to see the recipe. I need to see the pictures. I've got you. Go to cookthestory.com slash ROTD and you'll get everything you need there. And then, of course, there's also our Facebook group. I do post the links to the recipe of the day every single morning in the Facebook group. So that's a great way to find it and just to see what's going on. So head to facebook.com slash groups slash recipe OTD to join that group. And I recently did add some like questions for joining. So do make sure you answer those. And then I know that you are real and not a bot because we were having weird spam issues in that group. Remember, it seems to be done now, but just answer the questions however you want. And then I'll know you're a real person and I will let you in. So that's facebook.com slash groups slash recipe OTD. I look forward to seeing you there. I'm Christine Pittman from cookthestory.com, thecookful.com, the all new chicken cookbook. And from this podcast recipe of the day, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Let's get cooking.